So let us discuss question number 26. Which one of the following reproductive structures is unpaired? Number 1 seminal vesicle, number 2 cowper's gland, 3 ejaculatory duct, 4 prostate gland and 5 vas deferens. In your A-level paper, you must be able to list the main structures and also list their functions of the male and the female reproductive system. So let us take a brief moment and go through the male reproductive system along with their functions in a very brief manner. We will start at the testis. So the testis lies in a scrotal sac. It is unique because it is the only organ that exists outside the abdominal cavity. It is paired and it is oval shaped. What is its function? Production of sperm as well as production of testosterone. So the testis produces sperm which is passed into this coil tube that lies above the testis. This is known as the epididymis. So what is its function? It has three major functions. Remember, it stores the sperm. It helps to mature the sperm physiologically, which means it makes the sperm more mobile and it also allows the sperm to gain the ability to fertilize and it is responsible for secreting a small part of the seminal fluid. Stores the sperm, matures the sperm and secretes a part of the seminal fluid. The epididymis finally ends in the vas deferens. So vas deferens is a duct. It's essentially a piping system that transports sperm from the epididymis to the urethra. The next major structure is the urethra. The urethra starts from the urinary bladder and passes through the prostate gland into the penis. Its function is transporting both urine and semen. So what is the responsibility or what's the function of a prostate gland? This secretes slightly alkaline fluid with mucus. So it helps to neutralize the vaginal acidity and it also helps in lubrication. So an important thing that you have to notice right now is that the prostate gland is not paired. It is the unpaired structure which makes the prostate gland the answer to this question. In addition to that, this cowper's gland which is also known as a bulbourethral gland it is responsible for adding fluids to semen during the process of ejaculation. Question number 27. Which of the following growth substances prevent leaf fall? Abscisic acid, auxins, cytokinins, gibberellins or ethylin. You must be able to list the plant growth substance and its function because this can come mainly in the MCQs than expecting it in the, in the essay questions. So the commonest plant growth substance is indoleacetic acid. It is a type of auxin. What is its responsibility? It is mainly responsible for the induction of growth. Whether it is root growth or whether it is fruit growth. It is responsible for also causing elongation of cells. It has other functions too. It inhibits cambial activity. And it also helps in the regulation of apical movements. Important things to remember about indoleacetic acid is it is a commonest toxin. It is responsible for growth, both root growth, fruit growth and it is responsible for elongation of cells. Moving on to the next plant growth substance that is abscisic acid. Abscisic acid is something that protects the uh, plant organism by helping it to resist adverse conditions. For example, seed germination will be stopped if the conditions are not good. So it inhibits seed germination during stressful conditions. Or it closes the stomata at water stress conditions. It will inhibit bud growth and cambium activity in the winter in plants growing in temperate countries. So as you can see a common feature is it helps to confer a bit of resistance to the plants to tide over harsh conditions. Gibberellins are responsible for elongation of cell stems and activating enzymes in seed germination. Ethylene is something that uh, we are all familiar with, uh, responsible for stem elongation and it is used to induce ripening of fruits and it is used to induce flowering in some plants. Cytokinins, they are responsible for promoting shoot growth. So remember there is a difference between indoleacetic acid and cytokinins. Indoleacetic acid will maintain apical dominance. 
whereas cytokinins are inhibiting apical dominance and an important function of cytokinins is the fact that it delays the loss or senescence of leaves so remember that too so question number 27 which of the following growth substances prevent leaf fall the answer is 3 cytokinins question number 28 two true breeding plants one with blue flowers and one with white flowers were crossed the f1 offspring of this cross produced light blue flowers when the f1 progeny was self crossed one is to two is to one ratio of plants with dark blue light blue and white flowers was observed what genetic character is shown by these results so there are a few pointers in the question itself that you need to focus on number one it's purebred plants which means that the genotype is going to be either purely recessive or purely dominant and when the flowers were crossed you got a phenotype in the next generation in the f1 progeny which was neither the dominant or the recessive phenotype so you got kind of a mixture and then when you crossed it again you got a 1 is to 2 is to 1 ratio of dark blue light blue and white flowers so this is a typical example of incomplete dominance which i will talk to you in the next slide so before that let's just go through a few of the other characteristics that are shown here so epistasis incomplete dominance codominance polyallelism and gene linkage so these are all types of non mendelian inheritance that means these types of inheritance patterns defies the normal mendelian laws so now let us discuss about the first non mendelian inheritance pattern of epistasis epistasis is a gene interaction which is antagonistic that means one gene is going to interfere with the expression of another gene so a typical example we can use for this is pigmentation in mice so if you look at the cross right here you can see that we have two agouti mice being crossed so the color of agouti or brown is determined by the gene a so the brown is dominant whereas a simple double a is recessive but you can observe if you key, if you keenly observe here you can see that if you need a color whether it is brown or whether it is black if you need a color you definitely need the presence of c a capital c the moment you do not have that particular gene occurring if you have two simple c's irrespective of what your a is whether it is dominant whether it is recessive you will not get a color what this means is if you have a gene with two c's irrespective of what occurs on the other loci whether you have capital a a dominant a or a recessive gene you will not get the color so this means a separate gene is essential for pigment production so now if you move on to the next non mendelian inheritance pattern which is incomplete dominance so we will focus on this flower right here so you have a purebred red plant and a purebred white flower being crossed and the result of it is neither red nor white you get a mixture of it which is pink so this is a type of incomplete dominance and if you focus on a self cross and you get it here again you can see that whenever you have a pair of the recessive and the dominant um, genes you will not get one over the other you will get a mixture of both in a one is to two is to one ratio so this is an example of incomplete dominance which was shown in the question and therefore is the answer to that particular question to breeze through a few other non mendelian inheritance pattern one of which is codominance in codominance both alleles are going to be expressed phenotypically that means there is no one dominant gene it's not a mixture both will be expressed so for example uh, your blood group a b o so a and b can occur together in an ab blood group group without one being dominant over the other and the other example is gene linkage 
gene linkage is against the mendelian principle of independent assortment which means that the genes will redistribute independent of each other but they have noticed that when you cross people repetitively certain characteristics have a tendency to occur together for example you can get blue eyes and blonde hair or brown eyes and black hair or brown hair so certain characteristics occurs together so there is a tendency for one assortment to influence how the other one will get assorted so this is another example of non mendelian inheritance so question number 29 is an easy question so which of the following combination of triplet codes in the corresponding mrna and trna is a correct representation of the triplet code cat or cat in dna so few you only need two principles to be able to answer this question first thing that you need to know is that the mrna is complementary to the dna and the trna is complementary to the mrna and the other thing you need to remember is that your rnas do not have thiamine and instead they have uracil with this in mind it is very easy for you to identify that your c in the dna becomes g mrna and becomes c again in the trna do this for everything and you will understand that your answer is g u a in the mrna and c a u in the trna which gives you the answer number 3 so discussing question number 30 it is also a genetics question so a cross between pure line short black hair and pure line long white hair guinea pigs produce short black hair offspring in the f1 generation so like i told you before pure line means that the genotype is purely recessive or purely dominant and when you cross pure lines together the resulting offspring will all have dominant features so because you have short black hair offspring here you need to know that the dominant feature is short black hair and if you cross the species in the f1 generation they are asking you how many of them will have both dominant characteristics if there were 33 offspring in the f2 generation of this cross how many of them would have short black hair according to mendel's law so i have shown you here how the cross will take place and like i told you before when purely dominant uh, characteristics and purely recessive characteristic interbreed what you get is a generation with dominant phenotypes and a mixed uh, genotype and when you recross it what you are going to get is let's to simplify it just follow this itself and later on we'll replace the words with short black hair so in this particular case you can see that the round yellow characteristic is the dominant feature and the green wrinkled characteristic is the recessive feature so finally we got round yellow uh, seeds completely 100% in the f1 generation and in the f2 generation you can see that the things came in a ratio of 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 so this is fixed and you need to remember it so that your calculations become easier and you don't have to do this entire thing so the question is how many of them will have short black hair which means how many of them will have both characteristics that are dominant so that is 9 9 out of 16 you will get characteristics that are purely dominant so you just now have to multiply 9 out of 16 by 33 in order to get your answer and then you will find that the number of species that have purely dominant characteristics is 19 so you will have 19 guinea pigs with short black hair So now let us discuss question number 31 which is also a genetics question which of the following statements regarding the inheritance of hemophilia is correct so before discussing the answers let us first discuss a little bit about hemophilia itself so hemophilia is a type of x linked recessive pattern type of inheritance what does that mean it means that the genes associated with these conditions are located on the x chromosome so in males they have only one 
X gene. So, one altered copy of the gene is enough to express the condition. In females who have two X chromosomes, both copies of the gene need to have the mutation in order to express these disorders. Because it's unlikely for women to have two altered copies of these genes, males are disproportionately at a higher risk of getting hemophilia than women. So one thing that you need to remember is a characteristic of X-linked inheritance is that fathers can't pass X-linked traits to their sons. It is the mothers who pass the X-linked trait to the sons. So if you have an affected father with hemophilia, remember that the sons will not get the disease unless the mother has the disease. So I will be discussing the answers in terms of the common crosses that you have to consider. So first cross that you need to consider is for answer number 2 and answer number 5. That is what will happen if a carrier woman marries a hemophilic man. So now that the father has hemophilia, there is a X chromosome that has the mutated gene. And the mother is a carrier, so she also has one X chromosome with the mutated gene. But she is a carrier and not a person with a disease because the other X chromosome is there to suppress that phenotypic expression. So if you look at the crosses here, there is a chance that the son might get or might not get hemophilia. Why? Because the son gets the X gene from the mother. So there's a 50% chance that the mother can give and there's a 50% chance the mother can't give depending on what X gene is received. So therefore the sons have a 50% chance of getting the disease. So answer number 5 is wrong. If a carrier woman marries a hemophilic man, all of the sons will be hemophilic is wrong. There's a 50% chance. And answer number 2 is that 50% of their children would be normal. So, as you can see in this cross here, there is a chance for one of her daughter to become a carrier and one of her daughter to become a person with the disease. Either way, both daughters are going to be affected somehow because they, without any doubt, have gotten the mutated X gene from their father. So, because of that, neither daughter is normal. So, because of this, we have to consider that there is only a 25% chance that the children will be normal because you have one carrier and two people who have the chance of expressing the phenotype and only one person to be normal. So, answer number 2 and answer number 5 have to be rejected on those grounds. Let's now move on to the other answers that discusses about the inheritance of haemophilia. So, what will happen if a carrier woman marries a normal man? So, look at the cross right here. So, because the man is normal, the, there will always be a healthy, non-mutated, normal X gene in the daughter. Because of this, there is no chance for the daughter to ever phenotypically express the disease. So, therefore, the children will either be normal or either be a carrier if it is a daughter. Whereas in the son's case, there is a 50% chance that the son can get the disease or 50% chance that the son won't get the disease because the mother is a carrier and she is not a person with the disease. So she can either give the son the mutated X gene or she can give the healthy X gene. Therefore, there is a 50% chance that the sons would be hemophilic. Because of this, there is only a 25% chance that you have a child who is hemophilic and that is definitely going to be a son. So, if a man, a carrier woman marries a normal man, 50% of their children will be hemophilic, that answer is wrong. And if a carrier woman marries a normal man, 50% of their children will be normal is correct because you can get one carrier and one person with the disease, but two children will be perfectly normal. And therefore, answer number four is correct. So for completion's sake, let's also discuss answer number three. If a normal woman marries a hemophilic man, 50% of their sons would be normal. So the mother does not have the disease. 
what does that mean that there is no chance for the sons to get the x gene that has a mutation so as long as the woman is normal there is zero percent chance for the son to get the disease remember that and you do not have to do an extensive calculation it's a disease that the mother passes to the sons so if the mother is normal the children will be 100 percent normal as long as it's a son so question number 32 this is a question about evolution and in order to tackle the paper it is important for you to know certain parts of evolution very well one such part is what are the evolutionary milestones that occurred in specific eras in specific periods of time so for convenience sake you know that the evolutionary history has been divided into four eras and 11 periods so you need to remember what happened during what, what era and what period during the archezoic era there was a period known as a precambrian period during this time bacteria and protists were the only living organisms that were present in fact photosynthetic organisms came only about 2.7 billion years ago before that it was only bacteria and protists in the archezoic era following that you had the mesozoic era during this period a large number of things happened so the word that we are all accustomed to the jurassic world the jurassic park so because of that the word jurassic is always associated with dinosaurs however it is not in the jurassic period it was in the triassic period that reptiles through adaptive radiation became dinosaurs during this time in addition to dinosaurs another group of animals came to be and that was the mammal group and although mammals are really dominant in the world today during the triassic period mammals played only a very small role in addition to that during the mesozoic era there was a cretaceous period where a large number of things happened so dinosaurs peaked flowering plants placental mammals and early fish these were all evolutionary milestones that the Cretaceous period came across. And again, for completion's sake, remember that conifers and insects came during the Permian period of Palazoic era. So now let's just go through the answers. Now let's go through the answers of question 32. Dinosaurs appeared during the same period mammals appeared. The answer is true. Insects appeared during the Palazoic era. It is true. Modern fish appeared in the Mesozoic era. That is also true. Placental mammals originated during the Cretaceous period. That is true. Conifers appeared during the Mesozoic era. That is false. It occurred during the Permian period of the Palazoic era about 280 million years ago. So the false answer or the incorrect answer is answer number 5. Let us now discuss question number 33. Which of the following terrestrial biomes shows the least variation in temperature? Temperate grasslands and temperate broadleaf forests, these both have distinct seasons. And because of that, they do show a variation in temperature. Coniferous forests also with their warm summers and cool winters also show variation in temperature. Tropical forests, on the other hand, are something like incubators and they have the least variation in the temperature this is what allows all the plants to grow at a constant steady state and this is what has conferred its unique characteristic of having the highest level of biodiversity in the world deserts show variation in temperature through the night as well as through the day so the correct answer for this is answer number four tropical forest question number 34 which of the following regarding the phosphorus cycle is correct? So phosphorus cycle, like the nitrogen cycle, is a biogeochemical process by which phosphorus is moved across the lithosphere, biosphere and hydrosphere. The atmosphere does not play a role in the movement of phosphorus. That is an important differentiating factor of the phosphorus cycle compared to nitrogen cycle or the oxygen cycle number one largest accumulation of phosphorus is in the soil this is false 
most of the phosphorus is found stored in rocks and minerals in rocks hpo42 minus is the most abundant form of inorganic phosphorus in the phosphorus cycle again this is false it is phosphate po43 minus that is the most abundant form of inorganic phosphorus number 3 is false as i said before because an atmospheric phase is not significant or absent in the phosphorus cycle plants absorb phosphorus in the form of h2po4 minus this is true plants absorb either h2po4 minus or hpo42 minus depending on the soil ph and soil conditions but in the solution form they do absorb phosphorus in the form that is given in this answer answer number 5 is false because human interference in the phosphorus cycle occurs this is mainly by the overuse or the careless use of phosphorus fertilizers so the final answer for answer question number 34 is answer number 4 now let us discuss question number 35 so this question is based on the following species so this part of your syllabus is filled with a large number of names that you have to memorize so to make your life easy what i did during my a levels was i had a separate book which i went through every morning with all the names under the specific categories so i didn't spend time separately to memorize instead every morning i would simply go through the book and because of repetition and because of familiarity i was able to remember this for the end of the exams because there are so many names so many species and the spellings are important i recommend this method instead of just memorizing it over and over familiarity is the key in order to um, get the ability to answer a question like this so yes let's go on Which of the following statements regarding the above species is correct? Two of the above species are invasive. So definitions are extremely important and you all have to remember the exact words because they give marks according to specific keywords that essentially have to be there in order to get that mark. So let's first define what an invasive species is. so invasive species should be a non native species what do i mean by non native species that means they should have been introduced from a different country it shouldn't be from our own grounds and this non native species should be able to spread beyond where it was introduced and then it also has to get established in a location so it has to be a non native species that spreads beyond its introduction site and it has to get established in new locations and a feature of invasive species is that it grows by taking up nutrition taking up space where other local biodiversity is usually there and because of this it could have a destructive effect on the local biodiversity so remember to write these four key points when you are defining what an invasive species is so this is a list of the invasive species it is important for you to know these because there will be mcqs like the one we just encountered so just for your interest take a minute later on and try to identify these photos and link it to the names that are given under the invasive species a little bit of home homework for you all so now let's move on to try to define what an endemic species is so an endemic species is separate from an invasive species whereas an invasive species was introduced from a different country an endemic species is a native species but what makes it different from other local biodiversity is that endemic species won't grow naturally anywhere else in the world so we have two plant species endemic to sri lanka and two animal species endemic to sri lanka 
So again I have included the pictures. Take a minute and try to identify which pictures go with which of these names. Can be a little bit of homework for you too. Organisms are also divided into sets according to the risks they face for their survival. So three such categories include critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable. They are similar in their definition. The difference is the spectrum of risk that they face. For example, critically endangered means that the organism is facing an extreme risk. Endangered, very high risk and vulnerable high risk so the definition changes only by one word critically endangered best available evidence shows that the organism is at extreme risk in living in the wild endangered best available evidence shows that the organism is in very high risk in living in the wild and vulnerable means the best available evidence shows the organism is at high risk in living in the wild. What are the critically endangered creatures in our country? So we have the Macrognathus aeral, which is a lesser smite spiny eel, and Dermocallis coratia, leatherback turtle. So I again, as I said before, keep on repeating it so that you all will remember. And the vulnerable species in our country is the Asian elephant, that is the Elephas maximus. Finally, we will talk about extinct species. So what do you mean by a species that is extinct? In order to categorize an animal under this category, there should be no doubt that every last individual from that species has died. For example, the dodo, uh, the woolly mammoth and Sri Lanka's own southern shrub toad, all these are categorized as extinct because beyond any reasonable doubt we know that every last individual organism from this species has died. Let's now discuss the answers for question number 35. Which of the following statements regarding the above species is correct? Two of the above species are invasive. So earlier when we were discussing about invasive species we came across five organisms. So, from that five, only Lantana camara is currently there in the list. All the others belong to other sets of organisms. Therefore, one is wrong. Two of the above species are endemic to Sri Lanka. So, out of the four organisms that we came across that were endemic to Sri Lanka, two were plants and two were animals. What were the plants? They are Dipterocarpus zelanica and Garcinia quesita also known as Goraka. And what were the two animals that were endemic to Sri Lanka? The black ruby barb, also known as Pontius nigrofaciatus, as well as the slender loris. So from that uh, set, we can see that two of them are here. Pontius nigrofaciatus, aka black ruby barb, as well as Garcinia quesita, Goraka. Therefore, two is correct. 3. Two of the above species are critically endangered. So, the lesser spiny eel and the leatherback turtle were the species that were critically endangered. Both of them are not here in the list. One of the species are extinct in the wild. So, the um, black wo the woolly mammoth, the southern shrub toad of Sri Lanka and the dodo. None of them are in the list again. So, 4 is wrong. None of the above species are included in the vulnerable category. That is wrong. E. Elephas maximus is belonging to the vulnerable, vulnerable category. So again 5 is wrong too. Therefore the correct answer is 2 of the above species are endemic to Sri Lanka with the endemic species being Pontius nigrofasciatus and Garcinia quesita. Now let us discuss question number 36 which is a microbiology question. Which of the following organisms cause foodborne infection containing endotoxin? So what is an endotoxin versus an exotoxin? So an exotoxin is a protein that has been synthesized within the cell and then it is released by exocytosis into the environment. 
Endotoxin on the other hand is a part of the component of the surrounding wall of the bacteria. Therefore, exotoxin is something synthesized inside and released outside to go and bind somewhere. Endotoxin is part of the uh, cell wall of the bacteria. So, from this list, it's something you will have to memorize, unfortunately. The organism that releases the endotoxin is Salmonella typhi. So, the answer is number 4. Question number 37. Which of the following is incorrect regarding prions? So, let's first discuss a little bit of prions. So, what are prions? They are actually proteins and it is even smaller than viruses. They have a very unique feature that is they are able to multiply without having nucleic acids. And they are very very dangerous. They cause a degenerative brain disease that ultimately results in death. And this set of disease is dubbed transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. For example, in humans, it causes Creutzfeldt jacob disease. And in cattle, it causes mad cow disease. Why is it known as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies? Because after these people die and they've done autopsies, the brain is found to have very large pores or it's very porous there are a lot of holes so because of that it since it resembles a sponge it is known as transmissible sponge form encephalopathies so do a little bit of homework and find how it is transmitted from cattle to cattle and human cattle to human so there can be a little bit of homework for you so let us find out the answer for question number 37 they are infectious particle containing proteins. That is true. They self-replicate in the host tissue using their own nucleic acid. That is a false statement. Prions are simple proteins that do not have nucleic acids. They are smaller than viruses. That is very true. They cause fatal brain diseases. True. Transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. Creutzfeldt jacob disease in humans. And mad cow disease in cattle. Diseases caused by them can be transmitted to humans from animals. That is true. Discussing question number 38. Which of the following is a genetically modified vaccine used in active immunization? So they are speaking about active immunity. So how is active immunity different from passive immunity? So active immunity means that an organism is producing its own antibodies whereas passive immunity is where you directly pass on the antibodies into the person itself without the person producing the antibodies themselves. So both active and passive immunity can be natural or artificial. If you can think of an example of natural passive immunity that is when antibodies pass from mother to her fetus through the placenta or when the mother gives antibodies to her newborn through breast milk. These are examples of natural passive immunity. So antibodies are passed on to the organism. And natural acquired immunity. So if at any given point you have been exposed to chickenpox, your body will produce antibodies and you will be safe from chickenpox for the rest of your life. They say that you are immunized. So that is an example of natural acquired immunity. It also happens in diseases like measles and mumps. So here your body has produced its own antibodies. Whereas artificial active or passive immunity is where we artificially introduce it. The principle of vaccination is based on artificial immunity. So this can either be active immunity where we introduce weakened microbial cells to protect against some diseases. Example of acquired artificial acquired immunity or vaccination is the polio vaccine or the BCG vaccine. We have introduced weak microorganisms in order to stimulate the body to produce antibodies that will be protective for the person against these particular diseases. 
artificially acquired passive immunity is when the immunity is obtained artificially by the injection of antibodies from another individual or another organism against specific diseases. We use this principle against tetanus and rabies where we introduce anti-tetanus antibodies or anti-rabies antibodies. Which of the following is a genetically modified vaccine used in active immunization? So they are looking for a vaccine that's both genetically modified and used in active immunization. So this excludes answer number one and answer number three. Because anti-tetanus vaccine and anti-rabies vaccine are both used for passive immunization. Where antibodies are introduced into the individual's body. Answer number four and answer number five are also wrong. Because although they use attenuated microorganisms, they are not genetically modified. They are weakened existing organisms that have been killed or become attenuated. So the answer actually is hepatitis B vaccine. This is a genetically modified vaccine and it is used in active immunization. Question number 39. Which of the following biochemical processes in the nitrogen cycle is affected by nitrosomonas? So before discussing that question, let's discuss the nitrogen cycle in its entirety. So let's start with nitrogen in the atmosphere. This nitrogen in the atmosphere can be converted to ammonia or nitrogen containing um, compounds in the soil such as nitrite or nitrate. The process of converting atmospheric nitrogen into these compounds is known as nitrogen fixation. So you can cause nitrogen fixation both naturally as well as artificially. One example of artificial nitrogen fixation is industrial fixation. Example Haber process that you may have come across in industrial chemistry. So in Haber process, nitrogen and hydrogen are combined in order to form ammonia. Other than that, you also have bacteria, both mutualistic bacteria and free living bacteria that can cause this conversion. Lightning also can combine oxygen and nitrogen in order to form uh, nitrate. So these processes will result in nitrogen in the atmosphere becoming all these compounds such as ammonia, nitrite and nitrate. So what are the uh, processes of nitrogen fixation that causes nitrogen to become ammonia. So as you can see in this diagram here, 1, 2 and 3. These are the processes that can cause nitrogen to become ammonia. 1 is industrial fixation, 2 is rhizobium bacteria which has a mutualistic relationship with the nodule of legumes and 3 is free living bacteria such as azotobacter and clostridium that can cause this conversion. Nitrate is obtained by lightning as well as industrial fixation. Now let's start from this point of ammonia. So ammonia or ammonium compounds can be converted into nitrite by nitrosomonas bacteria. And nitrite can be converted into nitrate by nitrobacter. So this process of conversion of ammonia into nitrate through nitrite is known as nitrification and the nitrifying bacteria involved are nitrosomonas and nitrobacter. So remember what does nitrosomonas do and what does nitrobacter do. So if there is a process of nitrification there is going to be a process of denitrification and there are bacteria involved in denitrification. These include the thiobacillus denitrificans and the pseudomonas denitrificans. So this brings the nitrogen in the atmosphere through nitrate back into nitrogen in the atmosphere in a full circle. There are nitrogen containing compounds such as proteins and nucleic acids in plants and microbes. So the, since animals eat the plants and microbes, they also have the nitrogen containing compounds such as proteins and DNA or nucleic acid in them as well. So when these organisms die the nitrogen in them is now going to be found in dead organic matter in addition to them that 
the nitrogen containing compounds can also be excreted in urea as well as in feces so it is also found in excreta so this dead organic matter and excreta are acted upon by saprophytic bacteria and fungi and they convert these nitrogen containing compounds into ammonia this is one other way by which ammonia containing compounds are brought to be so let's now see the answers for question number 39 number 1 proteolysis proteolysis is brought about by saprophytic bacteria and fungi they are decomposers nitrification yes the process of converting ammonia on ammonium compounds into nitrates which is one step of nitrification is done by nitrosomonas denitrification no denitrification is done by thiobacillus denitrificans and pseudomonas denitrificans nitrogen fixation so nitrogen fixation is also brought about by bacteria but it is not nitrosomonas it's rhizobium azotobacter and clostridium ammonification ammonification is performed by bacteria to convert organic nitrogen to ammonia so this is also done by the decomposers so the answer therefore in the end is going to be answer number 2 nitrification which of the following microorganisms are used in biological extraction of metals from low grade metal ores so microorganisms have always been used in commercial use because of its low cost as well as high production output so let us go through the answers to find which one is the right one pseudomonas aeruginosa so this is not something that is used commercially at least within us syllabus as i know bacillus thuringiensis so they have used this bacteria and they've gotten certain genes from this bacteria to incorporate into plants such as cotton and soya because it gives those plants an ability to resist attacks from insects but it is not used in the for the purpose that this question is asking aspergillus oryzae so aspergillus is a microorganism that is highly used in order to extract enzymes enzymes such as amylase and proteases so aspergillus oryzae is important for the production of enzymes commercially thiobacillus ferroxidans so this is our answer you have a clue as well ferro oxidant so it is essentially oxidizing iron so thio is generally for sulfur but in any case thiobacillus ferroxidans even if you have not studied this the name itself should give away that it is involved in something of uh, concerning metal so thiobacillus ferroxidan and thiobacillus thiooxidan these are used in extraction of metals like copper lactobacillus bulgaricus so lactobacillus bulgaricus is used in commercial production of lactic acid if you can remember some of the uses that we have spoken just before that is hepatitis b hepatitis b is used commercially for active immunization against that disease there are also other species in other uses for example saccharomyces cerevisiae which is essentially yeast is used in alcohol fermentation so if you can make a table and put the microorganism and then plot it against um the uses of those microorganisms and keep on getting familiar with it it is important to answer a question like this so in this case the answer is answer number 40 Uh, so answer number 4 thiobacillus ferrooxidan the mitochondria contains cristae which is a specialized structure in which is intermembranous space the oxidative phosphorylation system occurs the final objective of the oxidative phosphorylation system is the production of energy in the form of atp by oxidizing the reduced coenzymes that is nadh and fadh2 produced in the krebs cycle by using oxygen so oxygen will be converted into water nadh into nad plus fadh into fad plus and finally the end product 
also includes energy in the form of ATP. So which of the following is are the end products of oxidative phosphorylation? A. ATP is correct. B. Oxygen is false. It is one of the starting products which is converted into water. C. NAD plus is true. D. H2O is true. E. Carbon dioxide is false. Carbon dioxide is produced in the Krebs cycle. So the correct answers are A, C and D. Which of the following is are not a polymer of glucose? So glucose is a molecule that is extensively used in nutrition. So glucose can either bond together with certain other molecules to form disaccharides or glucose itself can polymerize to form polysaccharides. Examples of disaccharides formed using glucose is yes sucrose that is made from glucose and fructose galactose and glucose forms lactose and two glucose molecules get together to form maltose and glucose as i said can polymerize to form polysaccharides too examples of such things include glycogen an animal storage uh, carbohydrate starch which is a plant storage carb and cellulose which is a structural polysaccharide so these are the polymers of glucose and the disaccharides of glucose let's just go through the other uh, answers as well so pectin pectin is a polymer of galacturonic acid it is not a polymer of glucose inulin is a polymer of fructose glycogen yes and chitin is a polymer of N-acetyl D-glucosamine. So again, it is not a polymer of glucose. And cellulose, as I said before, it is a structural polysaccharide that is formed by the polymerization of glucose in branching chains. Now let's discuss question number 43. Which of the following feature or features can be seen in chordates and mollusks? So, Answer number A deals with the skeletal system. So if you consider the skeletal system of the mollusk, they actually do not have a true skeletal system. However, they do have a shell. This shell is generally found in the outside. So many of them actually have a pseudo exoskeleton. Some of them also have an endoskeleton. Example cuttlefish. Chordates have a characteristic internal skeleton. Moving on to the respiratory system of the mollusk and the chordates. So mollusks either have gills or they have tinidia in the mantle cavity for respiration. Landforms respire mainly through the mantle cavity. Chordates have different systems of respiration. For example, chondrichthyes and osteichthyes, they respire mainly by gills. Amphibia either respire by gills, lungs, skin and some even respire by the buccal cavity light, uh, lining. Reptilia, aves and mammalia, all these respire by lungs. However, respiring by gills is a feature that is seen in both mollusca and chordata. Moving on to the process of fertilization, mollusca and chordata are both unisexual, mollusca usually unisexual, and mollusca and chordata both fertilize via internal and external fertilization methods. However, within the phyla of chordata, many of the classes show a large variation in the process of fertilization. For example, cartilaginous fish or chondrichthyes show internal fertilization, osteichthyes or bony fish shows external fertilization, reptilia and upwards that is, aves and mammalia have only internal fertilization and amphibia shows both internal as well as external fertilization. So, it is important to know what are the classes of this uh, phyla that have only unisexual species or which of the following are only internal fertilization or what are the organisms that fertilize only through external fertilization you consider the phylum of mollusca it has four classes 
polyplacophora, bivalvia, gastropoda, and cephalopoda. From this, polyplacophorians and bivalvians they do not have eyes. Gastropoda has simple pair of eyes, and cephalopoda have well developed eyes. So, although there are some organisms with well developed eyes within the phylum of Mollusca, remember that bivalvia and polyplacophora they lack eyes. And when you move on to the phylum of Chordata, all throughout all the classes, they have well developed eyes, although there are differences there too. Radiola is an anatomical structure comparable to the tongue. It is used by the molluscans for feeding. It is unique only to the phylum of mollusca. Considering these features, a internal skeleton is found between both mollusk and chordates. Gills, yes, it is found between the two. Internal fertilization is found between the two. Well developed eyes can be seen within the two. E. radula is only seen among mollusks. Therefore, the correct answer is A, B, C, D. So, the answer is 5. Which of the following nutrition type and example combinations are correct? So, first we will discuss about nutritional types itself. So, if you consider nutritional types, they can be divided based on where the source of energy comes from and where the source of carbon comes from. And when I talk about energy, it can either come from chemicals or it can come from light. So, if the source of energy is from chemicals, you attach the word chemo to their nutritional type. For example, chemoautotrophs, chemoheterotrophs. These obtain their energy from chemicals as opposed to light. So, if they use light as their source of energy, you have to include the term photo. For example, photoautotrophs and photoheterotrophs. Next is their source of carbon. So, the source of carbon can be from an inorganic source or an organic source. The inorganic source commonly used is carbon dioxide. So, organisms that use inorganic sources are known as autotrophs and organisms that use an organic source is known as heterotrophs. Putting these together, you can form the nutritional type. You consider heterotrophic nutrition, they can be further divided into three types. They are saprotrophic, holozoic and symbiotic. Saprotrophic nutritional mode mainly depends on dead things. So, fungi are generally saprotrophic. So, muco is an example of a fungus which is saprotrophic. Most organisms, at least in the higher part of the evolutionary chain, they are holozoic which means that they take food and then they uh, digest the food, they absorb the nutrition from the food, they assimilate it into their uh, nutri nutritional requirements and finally the remnants are ejected through the uh, undig as undigested matter. So if you take Humans, for example, we ingest, digest, absorb, assimilate and finally eject. So, this generally involves an alimentary canal. Then the final nutritional mode is symbiotic. Symbiosis can also be divided into three. Mutualism, parasitism and commensalism. Mutualism is where both organisms are benefited. Parasitism is when one organism is benefited and one organism is actually harmed. Commensalism is where one organism is benefited and there is no effect on the other organism. But in order for this relationship, either mutualism, parasitism or commensalism to be categorized as symbiotic, it is essential that the organism in the relationship need to be from different species. So, think to yourself again as to what kind of relationship the hermit crab and the sea anemone shares. Now, let's discuss the question's answer. Cascuta is not a symbiotic relationship. It is a parasitic relationship. Photoautotroph, purple non-sulfur bacteria. That is not true. We saw in the examples before. Purple non-sulfur bacteria belongs to the nutritional type of photoheterotrophs. 
saprophytic muco that is a correct combination chemo autotrophic is nitrobacter that is a correct combination holozoic drosera it is also correct drosera is an example of an insectivorous plant insectivorous plants are also categorized under holozoic nutrition therefore the answer is answer number 5 now let us discuss the answers for question number 45 pumping of sodium and potassium are interdependent so in order to maintain the resting membrane potential the cells need to keep a very low concentration of sodium ions and a high level of potassium ions within the cell in order to do this the sodium potassium pump mechanism moves three sodium ions out and two potassium ions in thus totally they remove one positive charge carrier from the intracellular space the sodium potassium pump is located in the neurilemma the neurilemma is the cell membrane of schwann cells the sodium potassium atps pump is located in the cell membrane of the axons therefore this statement is false so the sodium potassium atps pump is responsible for transporting sodium from a place of less sodium to high sodium and potassium into a place where there's a lot of potassium so essentially it transports against the concentration gradient and any such transportation will require energy in neurons 75% of the energy expenditure is because of this pump without atp sodium potassium atps cannot function it is essential for the maintenance of resting membrane potential yes by finally causing the loss of one positive charge carrier every time it functions it results in an overall negative across the cell membrane therefore it is responsible for the maintenance of the resting membrane potential other functions of it include the restoration of the resting membrane potential by redistributing the charges which become altered during the action potential this is during the repolarization phase it also has other functions which i don't think is relevant to your syllabus but it has other functions in addition to the membrane potential as well e is wrong it does not pump sodium from extracellular fluid into the neuron it is the opposite Question number forty six. Urine output of a healthy adult person depends on which of the following? A. ADH level in blood. So there is a process known as osmoregulation. Osmoregulation ensures that the total volume of its blood plasma and concentration of its dissolved substances in both the plasma and tissue fluids are always constant. there are two ways by which you can achieve this one is you can control the amount of water in your body two second method is you can control the amount of salt that is gained and lost by the body so osmoregulation plays an important role in how much urine is produced by a person because it is urine production that is the main method of maintaining the osmolarity of the uh, blood plasma as well as tissue fluid so the mechanism involving in osmoregulation takes place in the kidney with the help of adh hormone so adh also known as anti diuretic hormone is produced by the hypothalamus it is stored by the posterior pituitary and it is released in response to changes in the blood osmolarity and when it is released it causes more reabsorption of water and where in the nephron does adh act adh acts in the distal convoluted tubule as well as in the collecting duct these parts that is the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct absorbs water only in the presence of adh the functioning of the hypothalamus so like i told you before adh is actually produced in the hypothalamus in addition to that the thirst mechanism is controlled by the hypothalamus as well the thirst mechanism is what controls how much water you take intake so 
because of these two things primarily if the hypothalamus has a disruption in in its functioning the urine output is definitely going to be affected functioning of the pct is important because obligatory reabsorption of water where 80% of water is absorbed irrespective of the water content of the body takes place in this place during exercise and heat stress both the glomerular filtration rate as well as the renal blood flow is markedly reduced the reason as to why the renal blood flow is reduced is because most of the blood is redirected towards muscles where you need the blood in order to increase oxygen uh, supply so this is going to result in a decreased urine output in addition to that during exercise water is also lost in the form of sweat this is also one other reason as to why the urine output can reduce due to physical activity how does e the blood volume affect the urine output so blood volume is a single most important determinant in actually determining the urine output so when the blood volume decreases with it the blood pressure also drops and in response to that all of these hormones adh is released aldosterone is released angiotensin is released the sympathetic nervous system is also activated the collective result of all the activation of this hormones is the fact that more water is reabsorbed in order to restore the amount of blood volume and thereby restore the blood pressure of the body so remember aldosterone angiotensin adh all of these are hormones that increases reabsorption of water so remember that blood volume is a very important determinant in ensuring the urine output is such that homeostasis is always achieved select the correct statement regarding the human placenta so you know that the human placenta is a barrier between the fetus as well as the mother it is special in the sense that it is the only organ in the body that is made of tissue from two different organisms both the maternal as well as the fetal tissue let us go through the answers it is a deciduous allantocorian type of placenta a deciduous placenta is a placenta that actually ruptures and tears during the time of parturition which is the case as far as human placentas are concerned they do not remain intact allantocorian type of placenta so an allantocorian membrane is formed when the allantois and the chorion layers fuse to form a separate layer so this is something you will be studying in embryology in detail later on in um university level but for now you just need to know that it is a type of deciduous allantocorian type of placenta that is very true if you look at the functions of the human placenta its number one function is to allow the exchange of material between mother and fetus so certain material comes from the mother to the fetus and certain material passes from the fetus to the mother so what are the uh things that the fetus obtains so obviously it requires oxygen it cannot breathe on its own it requires oxygen it needs energy it needs nutrition and therefore it obtains glucose amino acid lipids proteins minerals vitamins etc it requires water too in addition to that it also obtains certain hormones and as we discussed before one type of natural passive immunity is where antibodies pass from mother to fetus so several antibodies also pass it is not only good things that pass from the mother to the fetus there are certain dangerous things it can pass too for example certain viruses like hepatitis b and rubella can pass from mother to fetus which is why there are congenital rubella syndromes or congenital hepatitis infections these are all because viruses can transmit from mother to fetus certain toxins and certain other substances like alcohol and tobacco smoke can also pass to the fetus these are very dangerous because they are teratogenic and therefore can cause an alteration in the development of the baby from the fetus to the mother 
waste products like water urea and carbon dioxide will pass in addition to that the fetus also uh, the, the placenta also allows the passage of certain hormones into the mother's circulation so other functions of the human placenta include having an endocrine function so remember that the placenta can produce different hormones like estrogen progesterone human placenta lactogen and chorionic gonadotrophin so these are things that the human placenta produces and therefore it has an endocrine function as well it also allows attachment of the fetus to the mother it acts as a barrier against certain materials including certain drugs and it also prevents coagulation blood of blood because of rhesus factor mismatches and it protects the fetus from high blood pressure in the maternal circulation so remember that you might get an seq or a structure uh, an essay question that requires you to answer about the placenta so know the human placenta in detail so it produces hcg and progesterone at initial stages of pregnancy so like i told before it has an endocrine function where it produces estrogen progesterone hcg etc but hcg is produced early in the pregnancy but progesterone is not produced in the initial stages of pregnancy it comes in later stages of pregnancy it prevents mixing of fetal and maternal blood that is true and that is one way by which it is protecting the uh, fetus from both the rhesus factor mismatch as well as certain dangerous drugs and toxins it can produce prostaglandins that is true it does produce prostaglandins it allows passage of water from mother to fetus and fetus to mother the statement e is true because there is transplacental exchange of water as discussed before the endometrium is stratified epithelial cells to be specific it is cuboidal stratified epithelial cells in addition to that there are columnar mucus secreting glands as well now let us discuss question number 48 it is a question regarding the human uterus select the incorrect statement regarding the human womb so one thing that you need to be able to do is to list the structures as well as the functions of the female reproductive system this is one of your learning outcomes in reproduct in studying about reproductive processes in organisms so if we look at the reproductive system as a whole let's start at the ovaries so the ovaries are paired and almond shaped organs what are they responsible for they are the ones that produce the eggs or ova and they also produce female sex hormones like estrogen and progesterone the ovaries are uh, then release the ova which generally goes through something called the fallopian tube so fallopian tube is a funnel shaped duct system so what it does is it transports the secondary oocyte or morula towards the uterus and an important thing that you need to remember about the fallopian tube is that fertilization of the sperm and the ova they actually occur in the fallopian tube and then we come on to the uterus so the uterus is pear shaped it is a muscular organ it is a strong muscular organ so it starts as it's like an inverted pear that towards the bottom narrows in order to form a neck and from the uterus you move into the vagina so if you take the uterus it is made up of three layers it is made up of the endometrium myometrium and perimetrium endo means inside and peri means outside so you understand that uterus from in to out is made up of the endometrium myometrium and perimetrium so endometrium is the inner lining 
so you know most of the lining of all the tubes or the hollow structures is made up of epithelium this is true for anything the stomach is made up of epithelium the esophagus epithelium whether you take the trachea epithelium the epithelial structure differs from place to place but hollow organs are always lined with epithelium the endometrium is lined with stratified epithelium the middle layer has myometrium so myo means smooth muscles so remember the muscular layer of the uterus is a myometrium which occupies the middle of the uterus layers then finally you have the perimetrium perimetrium is made up of fibrous connective tissue what is the function of the uterus the function of the uterus is that number 1 it allows the embryo formed to implant so the posterior wall or the back wall of the uterus is where the embryo implants and then later on grows into the fetus so the uterus is also responsible for accommodating the fetus throughout through to term and when the time for parturition comes the uterus is responsible for providing the contractions in order to allow for the birth to take place so one thing that you can do as homework is find out what kind of epithelium your vagina is lined by or what kind of epithelium a vagina is lined by and what the function of the vagina is so now let us discuss the answers for question number 38 48 it is a hollow muscular pad shaped organ this is true progesterone inhibits its contractility so remember that immediately before parturition there is a sharp drop of progesterone levels so this is important in order to allow contractility which means that progesterone yes will inhibit the contractility of the human womb normally fertilization occurs within it is wrong we discussed that fertilization occurs in the fallopian tube its inner layer is composed of cuboidal epithelium and mucus secreting glands The endometrium is composed of stratified epithelium to be specific it is cuboidal stratified epithelium and it also has mucus secreting glands which are columnar cells so d is true at the end of pregnancy estrogen stimulates its secretions at the end of pregnancy estrogen does have a facilitatory action over the uterus and it stimulates contractions as well as secretions So E is true. Question number forty nine. Which of the following features are not common to all vascular plants? So before we discuss the classification of the plant phyla, and in that you identified that Bryophyta was the only uh, phylum that did not have any vascular tissue. Everything else from Lycophyta until Anthophyta all had vascular tissues present. They are all categorized under a single group known as Tracheophyta. what are the other features that are common amongst all of these tracheophytes so sporophyte being dominant is a feature that is found in all of these vascular plants bryophyta if you can remember right had the gametophytes that were dominant and photosynthetic but lycophyta onwards it was a sporophyte that became the dominant generation so these are the two features that are common for both for all the tracheophytes Now let's discuss the answers to question number 49. What are the features not common to all vascular plants? A development of seeds. Yes, this is not a feature that is common to all vascular plants. It is from Cycadophyta onwards that seed bearing plants came to be. Bryophyta, Lycophyta and Pteropyta are all seedless plants. Cycadophyta, Coniferophyta and Anthophyta are the seed bearing plants.
And for completion's sake, remember that anthophyta are the ones that have true seeds, that is, seeds in fruits. Cycadophyta and coniferophyta both are naked seeded plants. Alternation of generation is a type of life cycle in which there is a distinct haploid sexual phase and a distinct diploid asexual phase. So in plant language it means that there is an alternation between gametophytes and sporophytes and you know that this is a feature that is found in all of the plants including bryophyta. So, all the plants have a gametophytic generation and a sporophytic generation. How bryophyta varies from other vascular tissue is the fact that its gametophyte is dominant. But from lycophyta until anthophyta, the sporophyte becomes more and more dominant and the gametophytes become more and more dependent on the sporophytes. See photosynthetic gametophyte. So, as I said before, with each passing phyla, the gametophytes become more and more dependent on the sporophyte. In lycophyta, you have gametophytes that may or may not be photosynthetic. But definitely in psychodophyta, coniferophyte and anthophyta, the gametophytes are not photosynthetic and they are completely dependent on the sporophyte. Therefore, photosynthetic gametophytes is not a common feature to all vascular plants. Answer number D, heterospory. So first let me just clarify what homospory and heterospory means. Homospory refers to the production of a single kind of spore. Whereas heterospory refers to the production of two different types of spores. It will differ in size and sex. Usually you have the male microspore and the female megaspore. This is the main difference between homospory and heterospory. And when you take the vascular plants... Lycophyta can either be homosporous or heterosporous. Pterophyta are exclusively displaying homospory. Whereas from cycadophyta until anthophyta, it is only heterospory. So again, this is not a feature that is common among all of the vascular plants. Because you saw that there is some homosporous vascular tissue plants as well as some heterosporous vascular plants. Just for completion's sake again, bryophyta is a type of homosporous plant. Next E, dominant sporophyte. In vascular plants, all sporophytes are dominant and gametophytes are either partially or completely dependent on sporophytes. And therefore E is also a common feature. So what are the features that are not common to all vascular plants? A. Development of seeds. B. Alternation of generation is a common feature. So B is not true. C. Photosynthetic gametophyte is not a common feature. D. Heterospory is not a common feature. E. Dominant sporophyte is a common feature. So the answer is A, C, D. And the correct finalized answer is number 2. Coming to the 50th and final question of the A-Level 2016 paper. Which of the following statements is or are correct? An allele is one of the alternative forms of the same gene. This is a true statement. An allele is a variant form of a gene. It is responsible for one particular phenotype of the gene. So remember that the allele will occur in the same position or the same genetic loci of a chromosome. Since humans are diploid organisms, we get one allele from our father and one allele from our mother. B. Locus is a position of an allele in a DNA molecule. So in genetics, a locus, the plural of which is loci, is a specific and fixed position on a chromosome where a particular gene or gene marker is located. Statement C. Human ABO blood group is an example of codominance. This is false. Why? Because A and B blood groups show codominance, where if A and B occur together, the heterozygote will show characters determined by both alleles. But if A and O occur together, you find a feature of dominance, where A will be expressed phenotypically and O will be suppressed. Or if B and O, the allele responsible for O, are present together, the heterozygote will show features of B. 
so therefore abo is an example of a mixture of codominance and dominance it is not codominance alone instead the human abo blood group that entire category is an example of polyallelism where some genes have more than two forms of alleles and all these alleles are found in relatively high frequencies in the population gene is a basic unit of inheritance of a certain character this is true the cross carried out to determine the genotype of an organism is a back cross this is false a back cross is a cross where you uh, will cross the parent of an organism with a hybrid statement e the cross carried out to determine the genotype of an organism is a back cross this is false what is back cross back crossing is a crossing of a hybrid with one of its parents or somebody who is genetically similar to the parent with the objective of getting an offspring with a genetic identity that is similar to the off, to the parent so what do we do let's say that the parent is a pure bred purple colored flower and we mate it with a pure bred white colored flower and the final result is a heterozygous hybrid pinkish purple flower so in a back cross we take this pinkish purple flower and cross it again with a purple flower so then the next offspring that you get is even more similar to the parent than the offspring so what we are trying to do is by repetitively doing this we are trying to get a offspring or a generation of offsprings that share the genetic identity to a particular characteristic that we desire and therefore this is used in horticulture animal breeding and in producing gene knockout organisms the type of cross done in order to determine the genotype of an organism is known as a test cross so let's say that we have a red flower where red is the dominant type phenotype so this could either be homozygously red or it could be heterozygously red so what we do is we will be crossing this with a recessive phenotype so we know if it is recessive it must be homozygously recessive and then the resultant generation can either be all red or come in the normal mendelian ratio of 50 50 where you have two red flowers and two white flowers doing this entire cross as you can see here will help you to determine the dominant phenotype with the unknown genotype so this brings us to the end of the review of the final 25 mcq questions of the a level 2016 paper we really hope you have gained the maximum benefit from this and we hope you share this with your friends as well and i would like to wish you all the very best for you to achieve all the objectives and aims you have set out for yourself thank you very much